the insane and shocking life of eunuchs in imperial China, from orchestrating the downfall of ruling dynasties, to cuddling up with empresses and concubines, to becoming some of the most influential and powerful individuals of their time, all while missing quite an important limb. This is the insane and shocking life of eunuchs in imperial China, the lesser known side of Chinese castration. The eunuch system in China endured for over 2,000 years. Castration constituted just one of the six major punishments in imperial China up until the Xi Dynasty 581 to 618 CE, alongside branding through tattoos, cutting off noses, feet, or kneecaps, and execution by beheading. Castration was really just a middle ground between losing a foot and losing one's head. The imperial eunuch system began with Emperor Guangwu of the Han Dynasty, who reigned from 25 to 57 BCE. Crimes such as licentiousness, adultery, and promiscuity could get you the sort of punishment. Castrating someone was quite a brutal process. The surgery was often performed at home and without anesthetic. And the man, soon not to be less of a man, would only be given a nerve-stunning herbal tea. His genitals would be sliced off with a sharp hot knife as close to his body as possible. Goose quills would then be placed in his urethra to prevent a blockage and to allow his rather painful wound to heal. The new eunuch would then place his vessels on a high shelf in his house to symbolize their expectation that they will rise to a high social position. A kind of lucky charm, if you'd like. In Imperial China, around an eighth of eunuchs were young children who were pressured into this life by their parents. Families received money as a reward for their service to the Imperial family for donating their sons. They hoped that their children would live better as a result. Chinese men sometimes emasculated themselves so they could get a job in the palace. A not-so-small sacrifice they were willing to make. After they were castrated, young eunuchs would often wet their beds as their body learned to adapt to their missing genitals. For this, they received severe floggings from older eunuchs until they no longer wet their beds or themselves. These eunuchs were bullied and called Chu Tejin, stinking eunuchs. Bad enough to lose their you-know-what without being shunned by society. Eunuchs were also despised by the educated elite and military officials who often derogatorily referred to them as tailless dogs or spoutless teapots. This was because eunuchs usually served as personal attendants to the sovereign royalty, meaning they held better positions than the scholars and military officials, exercising more influence within the kingdom. Yet some eunuchs would probably have been willing to trade places with a scholar, if it meant regaining certain, uh, essentials. Eunuchs in the Forbidden City The Forbidden City was built during the Ming Dynasty in the 15th century, and it served as the residence for the Empress and Emperor's concubines. Here, the eunuchs devoted their lives to protecting the chastity of the imperial ladies. Chinese culture was rooted in Confucian values, where the emperor was regarded as heaven's representative on earth. It was customary for the emperor to have a male heir to continue his line of succession and maintain harmony between heaven and earth. So it was of the utmost importance to protect the empress from any other man that might intervene in the process of producing an heir or creating illegitimate ones. Strict moral purity in these women was crucial. Only castrated men were permitted to enter the Forbidden City's private quarters, and no functioning man other than the Emperor was allowed in. The Emperors had thousands of concubines in the Forbidden City, and only they had the joy of impregnating them. If the Emperor's queens couldn't bear the Emperor a living heir, then the son of the highest-ranking concubine would inherit the throne. Thousands of eunuchs were appointed to protect the Emperor's offspring, some even learning martial arts to do so. After staying with a wet nurse until they were weaned, these royal princesses were handed over to the eunuchs. No doubt the eunuchs formed close bonds with them, because one day these princes might rise to power and become emperors themselves. Young princesses were groomed into believing they could trust only the eunuchs. Eunuchs also took advantage of rivalries between concubines in the harem. 
concubines and eunuchs would scheme to get their sons in line for succession. If the plan worked, the eunuch would also become very powerful, except in bed. A day in the life of a eunuch. Getting castrated almost always secured one a job in the imperial service. For those who were impoverished, the choice often boiled down to surrendering their manhood or enduring a life of begging and theft. A tough choice. Eunuchs easily stood out from the rest of the population. Their distinctive stride was unmistakable. Even from a distance, you could observe them leaning slightly forward, legs close together, taking short steps, and turning their toes outward. Their high-pitched falsetto voices betrayed their unmanly calling. Bearded and with a bloated appearance, low-ranking eunuchs wore long gray robes and a short dark blue coat paired with official hats and boots. On the other hand, hairless and skinny high-ranking palace eunuchs flaunted ornate robes and embroidered colors. Eunuchs who worked in the imperial courts were in close contact with the emperor and could exert their influence on him, sometimes holding an immense amount of political power. In Chinese literature, these eunuchs are often depicted as treasonous, while young eunuchs under the age of 10 were particularly prized. The young ones were deemed as pure and not yet tainted by the immense power that corrupted the older ones, which according to old Chinese literature turned them into ruthless, greedy, scheming individuals. However, this wasn't universally true, as some eunuchs made valuable contributions to Chinese culture as they got older. For instance, Kai Lun, a eunuch during the Han Dynasty. Invented paper well during the Ming Dynasty, eunuchs used to play Western classical music to enrich the court's musical culture. In the Qing Dynasty, eunuchs wore European suits and wigs and played comical scenes for the entertainment of Emperor Qing Long. It's evident that not all were as mischievous as Varys from Game of Thrones. Eunuchs were also allowed to worship in temples, practice fasting, burn incense, and make monetary contributions. However, they were restricted from ascending the altar of the main deity, akin to cripples, those lacking limbs, deformed individuals, and menstruating women. After all, eunuchs were missing a limb, and quite an important one at that. During their leisure time, eunuchs engaged in gambling and socialized with women and children. Even some had a soft spot for pets, keeping puppies as companions. Chow Gao, when a eunuch becomes evil. In the tumultuous era between 260 BCE, known as the Warring Period, Xiao Gao came from the ruling family of the state of Zhao. His parents committed a crime, so Zhao and his brother were punished for it. They paid the not quite ultimate price for their parents' transgression and were castrated. Zhao then became an expert in law and punishment. He quickly rose through the ranks and became a close advisor to the emperors. After the emperor passed away, Zhao and Prime Minister Li Shi organized a coup by arranging the assassination of the heir apparent, Fusu. Qin Shi Huang's youngest son, Hue, then became a puppet emperor, but he didn't stay in power for long, thanks to eunuch Zhao Gao, Fusu's son. Zaying became the new emperor. However, Zaying didn't trust Zhao. He did assassinate his father after all. The newfound emperor knew that Zhao would get rid of him the moment he was no longer of use, so Zaying had Zhao executed. Eunuchs were never considered a direct threat because of their inability to father their own dynasties, but they were actually more than capable of bringing down ruling dynasties. Zhao Gao serves as an evident example of a scheming, villainous eunuch because he brought down the Qin dynasty. Many even more evil eunuchs can be found in Chinese history, but this Zhao Gao is definitely in the top five. China's last eunuch, Sun Yaoting. The eunuch system was abolished on November 5, 1924. The last emperor, Puyi, and 1,500 eunuchs were kicked out of the forbidden city. Sun Yaoting is the opposite of the scheming evil eunuch stereotype such as Zhao Gao. Historian Jia Yinghua recorded Sun's stories, some of which are rather painful, intimate, and embarrassing. Sun Yaoting grew up tormented and poor. Thieves burned down the family home and they stole their fields. So Sun's family made a big decision on his behalf and had his genitals cut off. 
Sadly, the castration was in vain because the emperor he was hoping to serve abdicated the throne. If he hadn't abdicated, then soon might have become a powerful eunuch. But alas, he became a relic of old. During the 1966-76 Chinese Cultural Revolution, eunuchs were shunned upon. Sun was punished because he was seen as the emperor's slave. Other eunuchs fled the forbidden city with palace treasures. Then years of ideological turbulence and civil war followed. Sun kept the secrets of the emperors only to reveal them decades later. He went on to become the most valued relic. According to Sun, the promise of great power came with incontinence and shame. He passed away in 1996 in an old temple. Sun never became rich and powerful. However, he became rich in experience and secrets. We are almost at 700 subscribers and want to thank each one of you. Feel free to check out some of our other videos and don't forget to subscribe to Uncharted History.